Good day, everyone. My name is Bobby Harrell. I'm the Business Development Manager for Strand Lighting, primarily dealing with systems. Uh, we have with us today Tom Stanziano, who is our East Coast Systems Regional Sales Manager, and I will let him introduce himself. And uh, Tom, I'd love for you to talk a little about, about your House of Worship background, um, which uh, helps, helps um, let people know your credentials for being able to give a presentation like this. So, Tom, take it away. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Bobby mentioned, my name is Tom Stanziano. I'm the Eastern Regional uh, Systems Manager. Uh, I've been with the company nearly eight years. Prior to coming to Strand Verilite, I had the uh, honor and privilege of working with Joel Osteen Ministries and Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. Uh, I spent a little over 10 years uh, as the lighting director. Uh, I was a part of the design team uh, transforming the compact center into the the worship space that it is today and uh, for those who aren't familiar with Lakewood Church it is uh, it is now a worship center that they converted from a 16,000 seat basketball arena uh, as a part of my duties with Lakewood I was also the touring LD uh, so I had the uh, the opportunity to travel around the world uh, doing basically live concerts for Joel Osteen. Uh, during my time at Lakewood, I've spent countless hours with different ministries around the world. Um, through that, I created these worship, worship presentations uh, that I've been able to teach to seminars um, all over the world, uh, including WFX, LDI, uh, Technologies for Worship. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So this, this session is called Lighting Design for the House of Worship. So we're going to talk about the basics of worship design um, because there's a lot of information that I didn't know coming from a live and theatrical background that the worship lighting needed. So why, why do we need lighting? Well, we need lighting to see. We need it to communicate. The light helps carry the information from the world to our eyes, to our brains. That way we're able to put it into um, a form that we can understand. Now, how do we do that? Well, the science and the art. So to be able to understand what lighting is, we have to understand the science behind it. That way we're able, able to utilize the art that we're trying to create. One of the first things that we need to do is understand what the properties of light are. Angles or direction that the light is coming from. The quality of light. Is it a soft light? Is it a harsh, hard light? Intensity or the brightness. Now, there's many people that don't understand that we don't have to run the intensity at 100%. We have the capabilities of adjusting the intensities making it uh, more purposeful for what we're trying to present. Color and texture. Uh, there's a lot of lighting designers that I know that are afraid of color and texture, but it takes a very delicate balance to getting the right color, or the right texture to frame the image that we're trying to create. Uh, the last thing is movement and timing. This becomes important. It's not the actual physical movement on the stage it's how our services flow uh, most of us will get a script from you know beginning of service to the end of service and it's the timing of how all that flows and transitions from one uh, section of the service to the other so as a lighting designer we need to know what our capabilities are so as a lighting designer we know how to use the light we need to be able to evoke the appropriate mood, indicate the time and day and location. Uh, this becomes important if we're doing any kind of illustrated sermons or any kind of plays. Uh, the ability to shift emphasis or the focus from one area to another. Uh, how many times have we been in a worship uh, song and the guitar player breaks out into a solo or we've got a saxophone player? We want to be able to highlight those different uh, times, those different um, actions within, within a song. We need to be able to use light to reinforce the style of the production. 
we want to be able to make objects appear flat and three-dimensional. Uh, when we start to introduce cameras or image magnification into our service, it becomes very important to start to, to see the flatness or the three-dimensionality of, of the service. And importantly, the blend of all the elements on the stage. We want it to look purposeful. We don't want it to look like, you know, something is out of place. So we help that with lighting, either lighting the element or not lighting the element. As a lighting consultant, uh, I have been brought in to, to work with many different ministries. And one of the first meetings that we have is talking about the design. Well, for me, to start a design, I need to understand the purpose. And there's been several ministries that, you know, we're having that initial meeting, and I ask them, what is your mission statement? What, what are you trying to achieve with the ministry? And they basically told me, well, that's why we hired you. I am happy to, to help provide that information or help find the purpose, but I'm there for a very short amount of time. I want to get to know the ministry, feel, you know, what, what the, the uh, priorities are within the community to find the purpose. But ultimately, that purpose has to come from the, the, the leadership. Uh, the next, what kind of building is it? You know, or what kind of location are you in? Is it new construction? Is it a renovation? Uh, are you building from the ground up? Are you in a strip mall location? Those all become important because of the angles that, that we need to work with. Uh, the size of the venue. You know, are we looking at, you know, uh, a very wide but shallow area, or is it very deep and narrow? Uh, another important element is ceiling heights. You know, to be able to achieve the proper angles, we need to make sure that we have the hanging positions. Something that I encounter quite a bit is the audience lighting. There are many instances where the only audience lighting is produced by a fluorescent light source, which obviously we don't have very much control. The color temperature is not right, um, but it becomes very difficult, especially if you're using any kind of uh, cameras. Uh, is it an incandescent system? You know, has it been converted over to LED? Uh, that all becomes important as we start to, to design the look and feel. Uh, set design is important. You know, what are the scenic elements? You know, do you have a choir? Where's the band placed? Um, there's a lot of ministries that for some reason they'll put the drum cage right behind the head of the pastor. So when we're looking at it through a camera, you know, it becomes a distraction. So everything needs to be placed accordingly. Lighting and placement uh, is, is important. You know, do you have trust? Do you have pipes? Uh, is it in a grid? You know, again, trying to achieve those, those proper angles. Power requirements, you know, how much power do you have in the building? How much power is necessary uh, to achieve the look that you're going for? Um, you know, there's, there's many Broadway theaters that simply cannot put another incandescent fixture. They're just, they're running out of power. Um, there's, there's theaters that are, are running generators in the alley, you know, just to be able to accommodate the lighting design. Uh, we've kind of gotten away from that now with the, um, the introduction of LEDs, but it's still important to make sure that the power requirements are there. You know, are you using video? Uh, where are the sound plugged in? You know, are they on separate transformers? Uh, do we have enough air conditioning to cool the space? And it's all kind of wrapped up in the budget. You know, how much money do you have to spend? Uh, to achieve the look that you're going for. Can you phase it out over time? Can you upgrade the infrastructure? Can you put in a good infrastructure and then add fixtures later on down the road? So these are all questions that I use to get started in the process. The next thing we do, because we've, we've all been asked by our pastors to at some point come up with a new lighting plan decided to do a new building um, renovation or a new building. So where, where do you start? And one of the things that I like to recommend is start with your local community. You know, talk to lighting designers, talk to your local production companies, 
talk to manufacturers, uh, go to trade shows. Uh, if you're doing any kind of uh, broadcast, you know, talk to the local TV stations, you know, check out the, the trade magazines. But more importantly, look within the community that you're in, you know, talk with other churches, you know, uh, talk to other churches that have gone through renovations to see what are the good things? What were the bad things? What were the gotchas that they went through? Uh, going through the building process at Lakewood, I understand a lot of those gotchas. So when I'm consulting, I can bring those questions, those concerns to the table right away to try to avoid some of those, those issues. But more importantly, do your research. Uh, one thing that I didn't put on this slide is social media. Um, what I see on, on social media is everyone goes to social media almost instantly to get opinions. Those are great. Um, I, I look at all the different churches to see what they're doing. Uh, I like to have conversations with them. But ultimately, it's that face-to-face -face conversation. It's, you know, it's creating that relationship with the church. Um, or those lighting designers that are going to get you a lot further than just looking at somebody's post on, on social media. Look at different types of services. You know, is your facility a traditional facility? You know, are you doing mostly uh, choral events? Uh, do you have organ music? You're doing the traditional style services. Or are you a contemporary church? Are you doing concerts? Are you doing illustrated sermons? Uh, Easter's and Christmas pageants. Are you doing dramas? Uh, those all become important because it's a different style. So the lighting design needs to reflect all of those um, those different elements. Um, when we talk about broadcast, that throws in a whole nother element. Because what I have found is worship lighting is a combination of theatrical, live event, and TV production. So there needs to be a nice balance between all three of those to achieve uh, th the proper pictures. So when we look at the elements, are we doing any kind of broadcast? Now, I classify broadcast is using image magnification, internet streaming, DVD recordings, cry rooms, overflow rooms, anything that you're actually digitally capturing with a camera and sending somewhere else. Uh, there's a lot of ministries that tell me we will never, ever, 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 ever do broadcast until they get a call from the local station that they have an open slot at 7 a.m. on Sunday, and now they're broadcasting. Some of them do it very well. Some of them not so well. And it's because that it's not set up to do any kind of broadcast. So asking these questions to begin with sets you up later on down the road when you decide that you do want to do some kind of broadcast. Building upon the idea of the ministry, so the purpose needs to reflect the style of the ministry. Uh, build upon an idea, a set piece, or a theme. Um, I've had many churches come to me and say, you know, this is our logo. We want to try to incorporate the logo of the ministry somewhere within our set design. Uh, we don't necessarily want a traditional cross, but we want some kind of element that signifies this is who we are. Um, Lakewood does that very well. I mean, it's the globe. Anytime that you see a globe on TV, you automatically know who that ministry is. We need to look at the stage layout, you know, where your vocals are going to be, where the soloists, where the ensembles are going to stand, your band placement. You know, are they going to be off to one side? Are they going to be split left and right? Um, are they going to be positioned in what we call the money shot, which is, you know, that shot that we're taking um, the close-up of the pastor? Do you have a choir? Are they on, uh, on risers? Are they in a loft? Are they on portable risers that need to be brought on and off every time? And then the style of the building. You know, what kind of architecture is in the building that we could utilize to light? And again, it all kind of circles back to the purpose. Uh, when I started at Lakewood, we knew that we were a television broadcast ministry. Everything we did was focused around TV and the cameras. So any positions, any uh, changes that we did, color played a big part of it. It's all about the purpose. 
So when we look at design principles, you've got the objects, you've got your properties, and that ultimately becomes the lighting design. So planning is, is, is key. You know, we want to define the visual concept of the event. We want to define the sections of the service. You know, like I mentioned earlier, we have a flow sheet, you know, from beginning to end. You know, where your praise and worship is, where your prayer time is, where the message is, where, where you're putting in communion. Uh, that all becomes part of the flow. And then we look at the installation, the hang and focus of the fixtures to be able to achieve the actual concept. And then the fun part is recording looks and playing them back. So let's dive in a little bit to the angles of the light. So what I like to do is I look at the pastor first and how we need to light the pastor. I look at facial features. You know, am I going to be able to do a higher angle or a lower angle because of the position of the, the eye sockets? I look at the positioning to be able to get some light from underneath or chin level. Backlight becomes important because, again, we want to be able to create that three dimension for any kind of broadcast. Straight on the face sometimes makes the, the a person feel flat, um, not very appealing. Overhead lights, same thing, very shadowy. So we want to be able to balance these light angles to achieve the best look possible. Traditionally, we look at a three-point lighting scheme. Uh, this is called the McCandless method, where your front light is at a 45-degree angle from the top and out, usually utilizing two fixtures from the front or your key lights crossing into the subject with a backlight. This is great for one area. In a theatrical setup, we would have multiple three-point lighting areas. This would give us the best coverage for all the different areas that, that we need. Now, when we start to introduce camera, sometimes this, this method doesn't always work based on the position of, of the cameras. So let's take a look at the different angles that we would use as uh, uh, within television. So the key light is going to be your main light that's pointed directly at the subject. Um, it's used to set the rest of the tone uh, of, of the scene, but it does cast some shadows. So we need to add a fill light from the other side to help balance out uh, the, the, the harshness of the key light. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as modeling, where you've got some nice soft shadows coming from the fill light in a combination with the harsh shadows coming from the key light. But to really balance everything is the backlight. You know, this is, again, going to create that separation, that, that 3D effect that we're looking for. You've got to be careful with backlight because it could be, become over, overproduced and it, it could really start to distort the image. So there is a balance between the backlight and the fill and key. If we look at a 40 to 50 degree angle, this is traditionally what we use in theater. We, we do this because we want to be able to look at creating drama and those angles help create the drama. For video, for me, it's a little shallower. You know, I'm looking at a 25 to 35 degree angle, something that's a little bit lower, but not necessarily in everybody's face. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have the pastor look like there's a bus coming straight at him. This lower angle it helps with um, raccoon eyes. So it just gets down a little bit shallower to be able to get into the facial features. You can think about adding footlights to help fill in from underneath. But if you have one of these roaming pastors, it doesn't really help very much. So a lot of times you kind of have to train the, the pastor and the speakers to be able to walk in a certain area. When you look at a traditional light plot, it may seem uh, very similar to what we're seeing now. Uh, you've got a position out front with lights crossing in. You've got a proscenium. You've got your areas marked off. You've got three different electrics. You've got some side positions. And then your third position is usually going to light up your backdrop. I take this you know, as my uh, theatrical base, but then I have to put it into you know, worship terminologies. So I define the areas because they're a little bit different than a traditional theater setup. So I'm looking to create different focus layers. 
Uh, because I'm a, a control freak, I want to be able to create uh, control each one of these different layers independently. Um, the floor area. Um, this is the, the preaching area. Uh, the generally prayer time or altar calls are used. Uh, I could light this from the front of house position. Me, I like to use PARs or Fresnels just to get a nice wash. Um, you could also use intelligent lights or uh, ellipsoidals. Uh, the next area I look at is the pulpit, you know, the preaching area. For me, uh, with Pastor Joel, it was five to six feet other side of the, the pulpit. Other ministers, they like to walk the whole gamut of the platform. And they also like to go down into the audience. That's why I need to have that separate control. So you need to be able to light that whole area that, that they walk. The next area that I'm looking at is the performance area. Um, I define this as mid to mid stage to downstage for our vocalists. Uh, whether it's a soloist or an ensemble, they'll usually stay mid stage. They may come downstage a little bit, but that's usually as far as they go. Uh, I like to use ellipsoidals because I have a little more control. Pars and Fresnels for a wash and then intelligent lights just to add some texture. The next area I'm looking at is the band. Traditionally, we have this upstage, sometimes split left and right. Um, I light this with the downstage position with either an ellipsoidal uh, to, to make it more of a special. I can also do pars and ellipsoidals to make it soft, and again, intelligent lights to give it some color, a little bit of texture. Then I'm looking at the choir. Is it in a loft? Is it in a riser? Um, I want to be able to control this, especially during message time, where I want the choir to disappear. You know, throwing a little bit of blue. Um, I traditionally will use either a par or a fresnel just to give it that nice soft look and a little more uh, less defined than my uh, pulpit or preaching area. Then, of course, we have the set and the background. We can light this from various positions with different types of fixtures, depending on the type of background or set, set design it is. Another position is house lighting. Again, we want to be able to control the house lighting because when we go from a high praise uh, section of the service into more of a worship, we want to be able to transition that nice and smooth. So being able to dim the, the house lights to transition into that deeper uh, state of worship. And then I have on there cleaning lights. You know, these are going to be the fluorescents that we use that, you know, our janitorial staff comes in and, you know, fills the, the seat backs and they does a lot of the cleanings. Again, we want to have these areas controlled independently so we can grab them quickly. So let's look at different parts of our system. So there's a lot of different components that we use to be able to achieve our lighting design. Uh, this picture here represents uh, a traditional theatrical setup, but now that we're seeing a lot more of churches, they're, they're adapting to more of a theatrical look and feel. Uh, some of them may have a proscenium arch or uh, an open stage, multiple electrics, different positions, but all of the elements are pretty much the same. You know, that's why I said it, it's kind of a combination between theater, television, and, and live events. Most of our applications are going to use some sort of power distribution, uh, whether that's a plug strip or connection uh, connector boxes, um, somewhere that we can plug the fixtures in. As, as we start to incorporate LEDs, these situations change a little bit different, but we still have to be able to flow power from uh, our power source to the fixtures. Our power source could be any number of different applications from a full-size dimmer rack to an architectural cabinet to just a standard relay cabinet. So our C21 rack is that traditional dimmer rack uh, available in 12 to 48 circuits. With Again, with LEDs, we are now able to transform our standard dimmer racks into something that we can be, it can be reused for LED technology. Architectural systems, uh, for smaller venues, uh, being able to utilize both incandescent and uh, relay sources. These are small, no fans, throw on the back of a wall. Very, um, very flexible in what we can do with these types of racks. Probably one of the most important uh, power sources that we have now are relay panels. Uh, as we transition into LEDs, 
they don't need any kind of dim power. Uh, they just want dumb power so the fixtures can be on all the time. So all of those elements can be be controlled through the fixture itself. Many applications, they run out of space very quickly. So we have the capabilities of putting those dimmer modules within our plug strips. Uh, this is our A21 powered raceway. Um, it just, it helps clean up the area. Uh, and again, utilize space differently that's just not available. Well, when we talk about relays and dimmers, it becomes very important when we look at LEDs, because as I mentioned, we just need dumb power for the fixtures. This becomes very cost effective to be able to upgrade into the newer technology. One of the key parts of our system is control. We need to be able to control all of those different elements, whether you're bringing in moving lights or LEDs, you have to have the control to be able to, to manipulate our different scenes. A lot of times I'll get asked, you know, what, what are some features that I require in a lighting console? And for me, it, it's an easy answer. It all depends on the functionality that you require. Um, I kind of relate it to, you know, buying shoes. You know, what, what fits me and is comfortable to me may not be comfortable to somebody else. So we really have to look at the functionality, who's using it, what is it being used for, to be able to uh, adequately make sure that we have enough control. But some of the advanced consoles now have things like 100 universes of DMX, motorized submasters, uh, unlimited submaster storage, unlimited groups, QLIS, color, color palettes, different effects engines. It all depends on what we're trying to achieve. One part of the system that tends to get left out is the architectural control. Uh, this becomes important in those applications where you don't necessarily need a console or a console operator. Um, if you've got prayer meetings that take place during the week and you don't want to have to have a lighting operator present, the architectural control can be programmed to bring up different looks to be able to accommodate those situations that it's just not big enough to bring in a lighting uh, console operator. Some of the architecture of uh, an architectural system, it controls everything from the dimmers to uh, touchscreens to the fixtures. It very simply can be, be manipulated either through a button station, a slider station, or a simple touchscreen. I kind of saved the best for last, fixtures, because there's so many different options that we can utilize from park hands to ellipsoidals to strip lights, fresnels, intelligent lighting. So we're going to take a look at each different type of fixture. Um, and see what they're good for, and just kind of get an idea of, of the technology that's out there. So the first thing I always like to start with is the Parkan. Uh, the Parkan has been a workhorse for many, many years. Um, it's simply a sealed glass lens lamp with a parabolic reflector with one or more filaments. Uh, Think about it as an old vehicle headlight. It produces an oval-shaped pool of light, very little control, very unfocusable. So the only adjustment there is, is by rotating uh, the lens. Uh, this will change the orientation of the oval. Uh, you can throw some barn doors in, you can throw some frost in it to kind of soften it up. Some newer models now have interchangeable lenses uh, utilizing a single lamp. Uh, to be able to, to manipulate the beam. Uh, obviously, now we've got many different types of LED models uh, that have both manual and electronic zoom. As I mentioned in kind of my breakdown, I like to use this for areas that I just need pools of light and very little control. One of my favorite lights is the ellipsoidal, or LECO. And uh, I put a little footnote down here at the bottom uh, of where the name Lico came from. So anyone that's interested, uh, do a little research. Uh, Nico, Lico is a, a name of, uh, it came from Strand, actually. Um, so there's a little bit of information down there for that. But it's simply an incandescent lamp or an LED uh, that's utilizing an elliptical reflector with one or two plano convex lenses. Produces a sharp beam that could be focused 
or defocused, as well as shaped. Traditionally, they'll have four shutters to allow the light to be controlled, uh, basically cutting off different set pieces or different areas. It'll come with a color frame, as well as have the ability to do gobo projection. Very versatile light. Um, even in the LED models that, that we're seeing now, uh, the color and the brightness, the intensity has is, is really gotten uh, drastically improved over the last five years. I will typically use this in you know, my performance areas, specials, backlight, side light, and pattern projection. Next fixture is going to be the Fresnel. It produces a soft beam, uh, well suited for washes and specials. The adjustment allows you to focus into a spot or flood it out. Most models will come with barn doors, allowing for a little bit of control. Uh, the newer LED module, uh, models work very similar to the old incandescent style. Uh, there's various sizes, various colors. Um, some of the accessories, again, I mentioned um, barn doors, gel holders, and if anyone remembers this, cookies. Uh, cookies was basically a board cut out to be able to uh, create different patterns, which later turned into a gobo for an ellipsoidal. We're seeing a lot more flat panel uh, lighting fixtures um, in our designs now, uh, simply because it helps give a nice uh, fill light type of effect. Um, I use this quite a bit in smaller venues that I don't have a lot of ceiling height. It really cuts down on some of the glare um, that I would get from using either an ellipsoidal or a Fresnel. So it just kind of helps soften it up quite a bit. Uh, these are designed for both studio uh, and location use. And they come in different types uh, from tunable white to fixed whites, different diffusers. Um, Again, it just it's a really nice soft light to help fill in those shadows. Strip lights and psych lights. This is one of the most basic fixtures um, in our lighting arsenal. Um, they've changed over the years, though, because traditionally it was a, a single light strip wired into either three or four circuits. Uh, we would color each one of those circuits to be able to create a, a wide variety of different color washes. Um, utilizing gels or even dichroic uh, glass filters. Because the intensity was so much, they tend to burn out quite a bit. Um, and any of you that have actually done theatrical work and know that just about every show has to get changed out. The addition to LEDs into this fixture has really opened up the opportunity to get even more creative. Usually this is the best return on investment within uh, a, a production because now we're not changing out gels. So we've got the flexibility to use multiple different colors. Um, and I found that in my career that even though a light was designed for a particular purpose, we could utilize it in very creative different applications. Um, you can see here that the, um, the, psych, the, the psych light down at the bottom is actually used as a set piece. Uh, we have done this in both theatrical productions as well as live entertainment, uh, just to have that creative element. Um, there's a few ministries uh, that are using this fixture as backlight as well. So again, once you understand the principles of design, then your creativity can really start to, to, uh, start to adapt. Intelligent lights. Uh, we see a lot of intelligent lights now in, in our productions because of the versatility. You know, one light can do multiple things. Uh, when I started my career many, many years ago, moving lights were very limited on what they can do. You know, they may have a single gobo wheel um, with very limited gobos. Uh, it may have had a color wheel. So the color mixing capabilities weren't really there. So now we're seeing features like, you know, the pan and the tilt, multiple gobo wheels, animation wheels, prisms color mixing, multiple color engines, uh, color correction uh, has become important, especially, again, when we're using those uh, broadcast application, we want to be able to color tune it for our cameras. So all of these different elements can play into our creativity. But again, it all goes back to control. You know, how much control do we have? How much are we going to need? Because as technology grows, 
the control becomes even more important. Special effect lighting. We're starting to see a lot more special effect lighting in our designs because we we want to go see an event. And the worship service has become that that event. You know, we want to be entertained as well as get a little bit of message. So we're seeing effect lighting become very predominant in, in what we're doing because, again, it's an attention grabber. Uh, so we're seeing things like strobe lights, black lights, mirror balls, the disco lighting effects, uh, gobo projection, um, moving strip lights. These are all becoming a part of you know the, the new look and feel of our, our productions. But a lot of the old fixtures still need the accessories. You know, they still need to be able to uh, utilize gobos or patterns. Uh, we still see a lot of old gel color scrollers out there um, for those facilities that haven't upgraded to LED technology yet. You know, we're seeing we're still seeing color changers. We're seeing gel filters, gobo rotators, top hats. Uh, these are all things that we can utilize to help with our creativity with standard fixtures. Uh, some of the biggest questions we get are the conversion to, to LED. There's different applications and a different tool for the different fixtures. So when we look at an LED, it can change colors, multiple colors, so we're utilizing less standardized fixtures. Because if we wanted to have a three color wash with an LED, we can utilize one fixture. In the past, we were using multiple fixtures. Again, it goes back to control. So we just need to look at what's the functionality, what is the purpose, what are we trying to achieve? Because we're finding that sometimes it's not a three-to-one replacement. It's actually a one-to-one replacement, you know, just based on the coverage needed and the type of style uh, that is required. Again, the fixture modes, you know, with the newer technology, we want as much control as possible. So we need to look at the type of fixture it is, the modes that they are, and the control modes. This is going to dictate, you know, what kind of uh, control surface do we need? You know, how many universes that we're going to utilize, uh, the functionality of, of the console. You know, what can those fixtures do? Because we're seeing newer technology ranging anywhere from a fixture that has five channels to uh, an LED moving light that has upwards of... 50 or 60 channels. And those control channels get eaten up very quickly when we start to add the different technology. How we utilize the fixtures are changing. So in the past, lamp-based fixtures used color gels or dichroics, where LED is utilizing a totally different type of uh, platform. So when we use gels or dichroics, it's known as subtractive color mixing. Basically, we're filtering out unwanted colors to have that image reflect the color that we want. LEDs, completely different tool set uh, than lamp-based fixtures. Most of them are going to have multiple color sources. Typically, it's going to be an RGBA, an RGBW. Uh, we're seeing fixtures now with RGBA, Lime, uh, UV, uh, amber. So there's multiple combinations of, of the fixtures. Again, it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Because if you don't, if you don't utilize the UV filter, then why purchase it? So there's a lot of different options out there. Uh, many of the LED intelligent lights now are using a very bright white light. And then color mixing like a traditional way uh, by utilizing either um, glass dichroics or, uh, or color wheels. So they're still using those principles of subtractive color mixing. And it just goes back to heat management and the flexibility of utilizing the technology. So expanding on color, for me, this is one of the most important aspects of my designs because I want to be able to create harmony. I want to be able to create visual interest because it's going to engage the audience. You know, it's going to help them create a sense of order and balance. Uh, for me, it goes a little deeper. You know, there's, there's psychological 
and personal experiences associated with colors. You know, I can remember uh, as a child that, you know, I'd be at a birthday party and I can remember that red balloon. So when I'm using red, you know, in my lighting designs, you know, I'm, I'm pulling from those personal experiences. You know, I'm listening to the songs and getting a sense of what the artist is trying to portray. And I'm, I'm visualizing the colors as I'm designing. Now, you have to be careful because things can get out of control. It could be chaotic. It could be hard to look at, uh, especially if you're doing any kind of flashing, uh, flashing of colors, strobing of colors, because our brains tend to reject what it can't organize. So using colors that aren't complementary, uh, it's good if that's the plan and it's purposeful. But, you know, a- again, it could be very hard to read. Same with the opposite. If it's underproduced, then people aren't going to be very, very interested. They're going to get bored. They're going to start looking around the room. Um, so there has to be a nice balance between, you know, the, the color and uh, the texture. Some colors that I like to use. Uh, so a nice warm front light. And again, this is all based on the ministry style um, because I've worked with ministries before and they like that stark white atmosphere. Um, it looks better on camera, but there's a lot of ministries. They want that nice warm feel. So when you walk into the room, it feels homey. You know, it feels comfortable. So I like to use nice warm fronts, um, bastard ambers, and there's the the equivalent gel manufacturer and number. Uh, you can also do cool fronts for accent. Uh, a nice light amber, uh, I'm sorry, uh, lavender. Um, and then there's the corresponding numbers. Backlight, I like to put a little tinge of blue just to help separate the background from the subject even a little bit more. Uh, my backgrounds, depending on the ministry, uh, throw a little red, a little primary blue, a little bit of green. It just helps to break break up the the uh, the scene a little bit more. And here's some examples of the color combinations that I would typically use for uh, high praise. Um, I like to use combinations of red and amber, uh, ambers and yellows, ambers and magentas, yellows and magentas, blues and ambers, uh, whites and reds, blues and whites. These, to me, are exciting colors. And during high praise, you want to create that excitement. There, there's nothing worse than uh, a performer standing on the stage to a lifeless audience. So to help them out a little bit, we use exciting colors. Because um, you may have noticed that on occasion, the singer will be you know, going through the song. They'll get to the end of the song. And then they'll go back to the chorus, you know, and then they'll just keep extending it and going over and over and over. That's the energy that they're building in the room. They're feeding off the energy of the audience. So the, the worship leader is pushing it to the audience. The audience is pushing it back to the stage and they're just feeding off of one another. That's what we want, that we want that excitement, that that feeling. Um, and a lot of worship leaders, they, they call it being in the spirit. We want to create that atmosphere of, of being in the spirit. But we also want to be able to transition into worship. So again, we want to be able to have control of the audience lights. We want to be able to, to tone down, going from high praise into that, that deeper sense of worship. Um, I like to color my audience because it makes them a part of what's going on. Um, so I'll use saturated colors like magentas and purples and purples and blues and blues and magentas just that those royal colors that really bring out the emotion but also throw in a little bit of accent you know throwing in some yellows throwing in a little bit of amber uh occasionally i'll even throw in a little bit of of green just you know to help break it up a little bit more to be able for our brains to be able to process a little bit better uh, another thing that I like to do is throw in texture because, again, it's going to help create that three-dimensional feel of it being alive, you know, feeling the texture, um, seeing the different layers. Don't be afraid to experiment. Um, 
you know, it, it's lighting. And the way that I look at lighting is, you know, you could do everything textbook and it look awful. But you can also take some very unconventional methods and it look fantastic. So don't be afraid to play with light, different angles and different textures and different colors. So being a part of, of Strand and Verilite has um, allowed me to use my, my position to minister to churches and schools and um, production houses. So it really gives me the opportunity to, to be able to um, refine my craft and to really work with my passion, which is the, the house of worship. And to that, I will turn that back over to Bobby if there's any questions. Wow, thanks for that, Tom. That was, that was uh, a really great presentation. Um, we do have a few minutes left, so if anyone has any questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, type them in the conversation box. Or since uh, we are... Um, uh, since the presentation is complete, if you'd like to just unmute um, and just sort of jump right in, you're certainly more than welcome to. And uh, we do have a question from Josh. Uh, how do you bring a good balance in lighting between um, between the the stage lighting and a big LED screen? Good question. <clears throat> so in in my experience, uh, again, because I'm a control freak, um, I, I view it as who has the most real estate, uh, which is typically going to be me. So what I like to do is try to utilize colors that really accentuate, um, and not distract. Uh, we look at video projectors, video screens as, as an element that needs to blend in with with everything else uh, same as if there was you know an arch or columns or god forbid plants so um, one of the tricks that i have found uh, through one of my mentors is to be able to tone down or color balance the screen uh, the same that we do with um, any of our monitors uh, and to be able to tone down kind of mute the screens a little bit more is to actually hang a shark's tooth scrim in front of it. Um, you don't get that scrimmy look, but it does mute the, the LED screen a little bit more to help balance it. All right, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we do have one more question from Daniel. What should the church with a low budget start with? Good question. Typically, where I like to start is, what is the purpose? You know, again, it all goes back to that. Um, what are the key features of, of your service? Uh, there's a lot of ministries that they put more emphasis on the message. So that's where I would start. I would look at creating the best look for the message. And then as budget allows, start to, to introduce the elements of uh, praise and worship all right good uh good suggestion there tom so uh tom thank you for doing the presentation and thank everybody for attending and have a good day bye-bye